welcome to another edition of Not A Collection Of Parts. My name is Julian Baker. You join me for my uh, regular look at the body and how it all joins up and, and anything else, science-based, anatomy-based, physiology-based, um, you know, diet, nutrition, what have you, and anything else that you uh, request or would like to see. So please don't hesitate to uh, reach out and on whatever um, platform you're watching this and, and request something for me to cover, and I would um, be delighted to go over it. This week I am going to show you a, a presentation that I gave at something called Therapy Expo, which is an annual conference exhibition event up at the NEC in Birmingham. And I've been presenting um, at, at uh, this uh, event for oh, you know years and years and years, uh, since its inception in Manchester many years ago. And um, I get asked to speak there um, quite regularly, and it's it's a privilege to go up there and, and share that and network, and we get to see lots of uh, people and friends that we don't see throughout the rest of the year. Um, uh, the the apologies in advance for the sound quality. It was recorded um, during the, the the rest of the conference, and lots of stuff going on around it. But you should get the idea of what's happening. And um, the the idea of this. Um, presentation is is about putting together structures that join up you know we have lots of understanding of individual muscles but there's something interesting that happens particularly in a lower body when things come together and um, I've, I've made this observation over many years um, during dissections and so I just wanted to um, bring the attention to it and I'll explain a little bit why um, you know some more at the end of that and uh, we'll go over it then so here it is therapy expo um, interesting enough I did first present uh, uh, proposed this to a conference called the British Fascia Symposium uh, which I had been um, um, involved in since its inception so many many years of of, of um, uh, working uh, on the exhibition at the conference sponsoring it putting money into it and uh, when I stepped down I thought well I'll just put a, a proposal in um, and um, I had been involved in selecting proposals for all the previous um, events so I know what a good proposal is and um, this was a good proposal it was a nail proposal and um, a little bit longer than you'll see here but uh, so uh, interesting enough and for some bizarre reason um, it wasn't accepted and I got a, uh, a group email from uh, the organizers uh, after all those years saying um, oh sorry just didn't have room to put you in so uh, I think some new people got on the committee and it became more about the personalities involved rather than the quality of the presentations or the content um, but there you go some things are fit for purpose and some things aren't and British Fascist Symposium is just not fit for purpose anymore so it's just all a bit weird uh, but anyway that's be that as it may Therapy Expo got it <laughs> and, and here it is and um, so enjoy and, and I'll see you at the end our next speaker is probably one of the few people at the moment who's actually running sessions with dissections on human cadavers and specifically for radiotherapists and people, and clinicians who do mobilisation and manipulation. So having the opportunity to have somebody like that to come and present, I think, has two real strong elements. One, it's great to have an anatomy-based lecture, and two, to highlight how important that concept of learning is and how important uh, and how much it should be re reintroduced. He's the CEO of Functional Anatomy, and I'd like you to welcome to Therapy Expo 23, Julian Baker. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, delighted to be here again. I was uh, been coming here to Therapy Expo since it was in, in, since inception in Manchester, so it's great to be uh, coming back. Uh, so, new paradigms. We've got to run through this quickly, but essentially, a paradigm is a is a a parallel way or a different way of thinking and looking at something. The great example of that was the reliance on uh, the mainspring in the watch that was that was all there was as far as watches were concerned, as far as Switzerland was concerned. And then quartz movement came along and suddenly the Swiss weren't making watches anymore. And so as far as anatomy is concerned, not much has changed in 300 years and we don't see that there's a need to. That's the problem is that you know we don't see that there's anything other than a mainspring that we need to study. The trouble is, is that the anatomy that we teach manual and movement therapists is probably not a good idea to be the same anatomy that we teach undergraduate medical students, and I'll explain why very shortly. Uh, so, it's always a hopefully. There we go. Um, 
So uh, I've got to remind myself that I'm here. So I do this thing on a Thursday, which is called Not a Collection of Parts. And that kind of sums up my whole ethos, is that the body is not a collection of parts. We study collections of parts, but at the end, people tend to forget to put it all back together again. Um, if I move my head across when I'm on a pair of skis or a bike or a horse, then that's going to move. So it therefore transfers forces oh, down through my body and they're the laws of physics. Now, medicine generally doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't like the laws of physics and anatomy completely ignores it. But, um, so that's really my principle. It's not a collection of parts. I put this out every Thursday. It's free. Head on over to the website, which is functionalanatomy.com. Uh, that's my social media things that I do very badly at posting on because I can't be bothered, but I should. So anybody wants to help me, there you go. I'm too busy um, uh, look, drilling down into things. So anatomy isn't function, and they, the term anatomy stems from the Greek words ana and tomi, meaning cutting up. And generally speaking, when we talk about cutting up, we're talking about hopefully dead people, you know, because it's frowned on to cut living people up. You know. Although the first neurotransmitter was discovered by a guy in 1920 who dissected a lot of frogs while they were still alive and squeezed the, uh, the stuff from the vagus nerve over their still beating hearts and it slowed it down. He went, aha, Vegastoff is what he called it, which is a really rubbish name, but it's another story. So our modern anatomy starts with a famous Belgian uh, called André Vesalius, who was, who was working out a powder in the 16th uh, century, um, and everybody hated him. You know, so they just were really annoyed with Vesalius because he said that Galen, who'd been around for 14, I mean, not physically around for 1,400 years, but he'd held sway for 1,400 years, was wrong. Um, and uh, the anatomists and doctors at the time were furious by, by Vesalius undermining Galen. Um, and, you know, he wasn't right in himself, but... So, Vesalius reconfigured the way that we understood anatomy, and from sort of that time onward, it hasn't really changed. And when you look at, say, Henry Gray and, and the, the beautiful paintings by Henry Van Dyke Carter, who did that, that book, you know, we're still studying that stuff. But it's not function. It's bits, and it's bits that have names that are given by dead white men. So just because we say sternoclidomastoid, it means it goes from the sternum and, and the cledo, which is a word meaning clebone, to the mastoid. It doesn't tell you anything about where it continues, where it comes from, where it's going to, or what else might be involved. So we have a very isolated approach. We've got to learn those. Who's ever been there? Like, I've got to learn that origin, insertion, nerve function, you know. And we find all the, you know, computer tools to do it. And, and we still haven't learned it, we still don't understand it. So this is where we end up with, we end up with a sort of the sum of its parts, you'll all have seen Netto, and don't get me wrong, we have to start somewhere, we have to have a reference point for this stuff, you know, and Netto's as good as any, but if you study Netto to understand the body, then you can study Bambi to understand zoology, you know, it's the same, the same principle. So, and all these individual structures are assigned individual functions and nerves, but what happens when they get put together? Well, you just don't think about it really, I guess. It's, it's one of those things. It's like, so uh, there we go, hopefully. So if we look at this, for example, I haven't got a pointer with me. I've got a pointer, I'll use my laser pointer on here, hopefully. That doesn't work. So if we look at this, for example, this is what we're going to come back to is our, uh, where you see the Anserina bursa. Uh, deep to semitendinosus gracilis and sartorius tendon. It's an important area. It's an important area to understand that a bursa in here. So this is on the medial side of the tibia. And you can see it stops there. You've got the patella, tibial tuberosity, patella ligament, and it stops. That, that connective tissue stops onto that tibial tuberosity, finished. All right? But there's a bursa. Why is there a bursa? So wherever you've got a bursa, it means there's a potential space. It's not a thing. You can't sort of dissect a bursa out. It's like, you know, I've, I've, there is a, a space between my hands, the palms of my hands. You can't see the space, and once you take it away, it's gone. So that's what, what a bursa is. But it's there, huh, all right. So where you've got a bursa, you've got a potential space that could be filled with fluid and therefore can get inflamed. Who's ever treated pes anserinus bursitis? Well, you, you, <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> because there's a lot of spaces in around there, a whole bunch of spaces that aren't listed and have little bits of blue on them, you know? So there's all kinds of weird things going in and out of this space that we're not really sure what they are, they're doing. Um, 
I'm a bit concerned because I've still got 25 and now it's gone blank there now, so I'll just keep going until you, a big shepherd's crook crawls, crawls me, pulls me off. So we have to understand the idea of, of movement, strain, and function. Again, we get this uh, allocated, these, these, these tissues. So these are from our friends, anatomy.tv. Great stuff, I mean, really good stuff um, that they have. And we, we, we learn this stuff as if this is functional. You know, now try climbing the stairs without moving your arms or your shoulder. If you go back and have a little look at climbing the stairs here, we can see his arms moving. So does that tell us that if his shoulder had been pinned or he had a neck injury, would therefore that function change? Well, yeah, it would have to. So we would have to rotate differently. He'd have to move differently. What about walking? Again, we've got his arms in there, but there's no suggestion of muscular contraction through the upper body. So we're assigning this function of walking to these muscles that are going red and green, but we're not actually assigning function. We're assigning contractility. I don't know. What else? Not much else. And of course, all the stuff that holds it in place is gone as well. So we're presenting an, a physical impossibility and saying, this is what we need to learn. And, and, I, and I struggle with this a lot. So I've come up with a new system. <laughs> and it's, it's just what, I, what I'm thinking about. And you can apply this wherever you like. And it's called TUI. And, and really all it is this, is like, think of, a, think of any structure you like in the body. And all I'm trying to get you people to do is to sort of reconfigure the thinking process a little bit. So I can't see if Ian's here, but uh, the chap just came up to me a minute ago in the speaker's lounge and he said, um, I was talking about QL release and I stopped myself because I've heard your lecture before and I'm like, I'm like, oh, Julian Baker's voice is in my head. What do we mean by release? What's happening? And I'm like, yes, I can die happy because if you're stopping and thinking about what you mean when you say that because you don't mean anything, we were on the process, we're on the road to reconfiguring a language that means something. And we talk an awful lot of cobblers that doesn't mean anything, you know? So this is just a way of you thinking and it's easily applicable. There's probably a book in it or a PhD or something like that. But TUI just means through, through, over, under and in. So think of, I don't know, think of a nerve or a muscle or a bone. What's going through it or what's it going through? And if nothing, fine. What's going over it, what's it going over? So what's in the area that there is traffic? What's under it? What's it under? And what's it in or what's in it? And by doing that, what we start to do is think about relationships. And it's the relationships that we have to consider as manual and movement therapists. If somebody, if somebody stands, if you, if you, there's a great study that I, that I talk about in one of those episodes about, about posture and gait and movement. So if you take stride length, there's my stride length, and now I bring my head forward and I try and take the same stride length, I can't, I can't do it. And so we've got a study out of Ohio that shows us that reduction in a care setting, reduction of a stride length, I think it was about five centimeters, predicts a fall within three weeks. Well, well that's phenomenal. So head goes forward, stride length reduces, try it in a minute. We haven't got time to do it now, but try it in a minute. Just take a normal stride length, now go into a flex position and try and take the same stride length. You can't do it. So what then happens is we don't get plantar flexion, we don't get movement, so we step instead of walk, head further comes forward, and hey presto, our full wrist goes up. Yeah. And so by thinking about why we're doing what we're doing, what our relationships are doing, we can start to assess people differently in a better way. So what this talk is about is about, about not about suggesting that any function is involved, it's just saying, this is something I've noticed, I think we need a classification for these things, and then we can argue about, <laughs> about what they might be doing after that, right? Just a quick interjection here, please, um, if you could possibly support me on Patreon, that'd be great. Um, just a few pounds a month uh, would be uh, make all the difference to me um, if you could just you know help reach out and help me there there's a lot of bonus material that I'll be putting onto there as well this PowerPoint presentation is going to go up on there as uh, as an example and there's a few other videos that I'll uh, be putting up there regularly so if you're watching this on YouTube uh, please like and subscribe just you know clicking a like on that is is phenomenal in terms of how it then uh, puts in puts that information out to other people and it really does uh, you know help the channel and help um, what I'm what I'm doing get out there so uh, please um, um, consider that and um, I will let you get back to um, watching what you're watching so 
um, I started to, to do dissection oh, 25 20 odd years ago because I was a manual movement therapist. I'd brought Bowen, the Bowen technique back to the UK in 1994. And I was teaching, and I didn't really know sort of my ass from my elbow in terms of what I was doing. And the stuff I was feeling as a therapist didn't make sense as far as the books were concerned. So I wanted to have a better understanding. And I met Gil Headley, went to America, hung out with him for about 15 years. And now I run my own dissections, a lot of stuff online, and there's you know, a lot of long story. But I'm trying to get this, uh, this idea of, of how will we classify something. And so I came up with, uh, a, with a Swedish physiotherapist called uh, Jenny Whitford about this idea of a trochlea. So within anatomy, what we see is that in anatomy, it's a structure resembling or acting like a pulley. But there's only a couple of those. There's not that many around at all. You've got one on the elbow, um, and you've got sort of around the eye. And that's it. Well, if you've got one, why can't you have more? And where will we look for them? Yeah. So. Who's, who's done physics to any great degree at university here or you? Well, forgive me for what I'm about to do because I might, you might have to really explain it to me in a minute because it's shocking. But we're going to do a bit of physics, all right? So just if I see you going, oh, then I, I know oh, what's going on. So let's have a little look at a pulley, all right? So the principle of a pulley, we've all used one before we pull. It changes the direction of an applied force and it can reduce the force needed to lift the weight. Yeah, so, and it's through the length of something that that's going to happen. So bear with me on this because you know, it takes a bit of your head getting around to. So a simple block and tackle. right? So we have the weight at one end and we have a force required. So the force required is in the other direction and the tension is equal between the, the, the two sides. Happy? The pulley redirects the direction of the force and the length of the rope gives the advantage but the height that's needed. So if you've got to one, lift that one foot, all right, then you're going to have to pull one foot of rope. No problem. I've already used that, I've already got that so far. If we add a pulley here, all right, there's our block and tackle. So if we add a pulley, then our mechanical advantage increases. Yeah? So the weight is still supported by twice the tension. Now, rather than one by the tension, the increased tension means that there's a decreased force. So increase of tension means a decreased force that's required to pull that weight, but the length is twice what it was before. So in order to lift that weight one foot, we have to now pull the rope two foot. So our mechanical advantage is, um, whereas before it was M equals one mechanical advantage, now it's M equals, is it two or minus two? You're not helpful. Thanks. I could have got away with saying anything, couldn't I, really? Minus two, all right? So, all right? so what we're seeing is that once we start to introduce different structures going in different directions and put them together and apply a force, we can have a mechanical advantage. And that happens all the time in the body. The physical impossibility of almost breathing and jumping up and down, if you look at the physiology, is, is, is prevalent all the time. Yeah? And, and medicine doesn't do physics very well. You know, anatomy doesn't do physics at all. So there we go. So there's our, our tension. And, and so on and so forth. You can increase it. So three uh, pulleys make, make, means the mechanical advantage is three times greater, four times greater for four pulleys, and so on and so forth. And we see this applied across lots of industries. The, 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 the pyramids were built on with, with pulleys, block and tackle systems. But in sailing, um, uh, not that I'm a sailor, do you know that's called a marine bollard? I knew what I was looking for, but I didn't know the name of it. You ever had that? You're like, oh, one of those things. What's it called? Don't know, but it's one of those. It's called a marine bollard, apparently. And you can pull the rope around. It's a very simple idea. You've got winches, which again on ratchets, but the same principle again of force applying and taking different directions. Then more complex pulleys um, and, and until you end up with ropes going in all kinds of places. And um, so it, it's, these principles have been applied for hundreds and hundreds of years and they're applied in, in the body. So if we look, go back and we look at our, uh, semi, uh, our peasant serinus, for example, we can see the application here that if the load is coming through one, direc oh, one direction and we have three different structures, then we're going to have a dispersal of the load and a change in the way the force is both transmitted um, and, and spread. So this is very, very important because everything is held in connected. The muscle is pathetically weak. It just falls apart. 
the moment you dissect it, the moment you touch it, it falls apart. So the connective tissue, fascia if you like, there's lots of different types of fascia, you can't call it one fascia, so the connective tissue is going to have to transfer that load. All right? So let's have a little look at that in this Pez Anserinus. Uh, a quick note of thanks to all the donors that I work with around the world um, and their families who let them go, they don't have funerals, and uh, th their hope is that it will inform and educate you so that you will help the living. They didn't need their body. So it's a, a, a note of thanks to all the donors. Um, they're the most important people in this and uh, to their families. So here's Pez Anserinus. I'm trying to get um, so I can, let's try this. Does that work? No. Try that. Oh, well, there we go. So here's our Pez Anserinus. Here's our patella. And so Pez Anserinus is made up of the three structures that we will say is semitendinosus, uh, gracilis, and sartorius, longest muscle in the body. But notice this, this is the patella. So here is one way of dissecting it, and there's lots of different ways. And then this is the crural fascia, and I've labeled it a bit uh, further on. Let's come back to this. This is a, a little video. But you see what I've got is the first uh, portion of it, which is going to be our uh, sartorius. And you see how it creates these separate pockets. So it's not just a bursa that's behind it on the tibia, but there's a bursa in and around. Each one of those has a completely separate unit. So my proposal is, is that where we see this, yeah, there it is, there's another one, and you see what behind it, there's our bacillus, and then behind that is our semitendinosus. And then it blends into a very, very, very strong layer of, of, of fascia that's going to be part and completely covers or goes into the crural fascia. You, you can't, if you trimmed off the crural fascia, that would just be coming with it. There's no separation to it at all. So anatomy and dissection, in terms of classical anatomy, means you stop there. You know, there's five or six books that you'll say, Grant's dissected, to get the diaphragm, cut here, do this, do that, do that. That's your diaphragm. But if you didn't, if you ignored that, and just kept cutting, you create a whole other structure with as much function potential as is the, you know, the, as the one Grant's dissector says you've got. You know, it's only according to the curriculum that says how you dissect it. So there's our third layer down underneath it, um, and I'm just teasing away to try and separate out those little structures. Yeah. So there it is labeled, vastus medialis, so big vastus medialis. Um, we've got the edge of sartorius, and look at how much the individuality of those structures are embedded into the tissues that then wrap themselves around uh, the patella. And then this is the rest of the crural fascia, which has been taken from way lateral onto the other side of the tibia. Yeah? So it's going way around the other side. The whole of that crural fascia is wrapping itself as part of the, the fascia of the lower limb, you know, which is going to become the, you know, the, the, you know, whatever else you want to call it. Okay. Fibularis is another one. Uh, so it's another structure that has a like system. There's a burst that goes through it. Fibularis longus. Lateral knee pain. Where's it going to go? Fibularis longus goes underneath, round the back of this uh, mal the lateral malleolus. Brevis stops onto the side of the foot, onto the, onto the uh, first edge of the foot, and then the longus goes across to the first metatarsal and creates this arch. But it's ending up here. Tertius similarly. So you've got three structures all acting with a kind of pulley-like mechanism that's suggesting that force is being loaded, transmitted, but coming back to one point. Very interesting. Yeah, so there it is. If you find uh, the runner's knees, um, check on that fibularis. Get down onto it. Have a little look at the side. You see this inversion, inversion of the foot, external rotation. It's only got to be tiny, and that load onto fibularis is uh, around the edge of the fibula. It's going to be huge. Um, and this is where fibularis is coming up to. This is where fibularis longness is coming all the way across. Look, first metatarsal, metatarsal, to the lateral side of the knee. Do we think of, oh, we go, well, this is a foot. You know, this is a plantar, plantar fascia. Well, hang on a minute. Well, it's, it's, it's coming as part of the lateral fascia of the knee. Is that blended into the crural fascia? You bet your bottom dollar it is. Yeah. We, we've got to start to think functionally and differently about how structures blend into each other if we're going to be functional anatomists, if we're going to assess, treat, uh, understand performance, understand injury. You know, you talk about ACL, well, there's those ACLs, but you know, the ACL can only do that, but it can also do that and that and that. What's mediating rotation as far as an ACL load is concerned? You've seen how patella is blended in with the uh, other parts of pes you, you have to then think about patella differently in relation to the tripod that's going up to the pelvis. Yeah. 
uh, Fibula's tertius. We will just ignore that for a little minute. And there we go again. We got our little blue bursas. So Henry Van Dyke Carter, who uh, was really stiffed over by Henry Gray. I'm going to just put a word out there for Henry Van Dyke Carter. It's you know, it's a great. There's going to be a film in it one day. Look at all these little bursae that are in there that he noticed. You know, they're not there, you can't see them like that, but they, they are covered and they, are, they suggest sliding movement. And wherever you see this, it suggests sliding movement. But you don't function associated with it within your anatomy book. Yeah? Kind of weird, right? It's just ignored. There's fibularis brevis. Look at how beautiful this slides around, this sliding mechanism, how sticky it is, longus and brevis. And they sit with each other and they slip themselves around the back of that lateral malleolus in a beautiful way. Yeah. Again, quick dissection of that. Sorry, it's a bit goopy, a bit messy. Uh, Apologise for that. But there it is. You just see the sliding mechanism. See it tucked underneath there, how I fold that back across. And you can see this is part of the retinacular tissues, which wrap themselves around. They don't just sit over the top of those structures. They wrap themselves. They create that tunnel-like uh, mechanism that you see here. Look, you see how it's embedded into that? Yeah. And then this is very, very new. Very, very new. Um, at, and uh, I've just literally done this a couple of weeks ago in, in America. I was running an, uh, a dissection. And uh, a lot of time, I'm sort of standing there with a dead person going uh, and it's midnight and I've just like lost control of my time and I'm thinking I, won I wonder if I could do this this is my favorite muscle we've all got a favorite muscle right no too weird anybody anybody want for the special prize tell me what this is anybody no Piriformis, very good guess, sir, but unfortunately you're wrong. Ow. It's very close. It is obturator internus. Now, you may not have heard of it because somebody's told you that piriformis is a syndrome. You can only have a syndrome if you've got a name. All right, so have you ever heard of obturator internus syndrome? Well, no, because you've possibly never heard of obturator internus. But it's a trick question at anatomy exams. Comes from the great cancer with piriformis. And it has two little fellas that sit either side of it. Let me get my laser out here. It has the gamelli uh, inferior and the gamelli superior. Superior wraps itself around obturator internus, which then goes inside the hip. This is the, the uh, sort of on the underside of the sciatic notch, inside the pelvis, and covers the obturator foramen, the hole that's in the pelvis. Obturator foramen means closed opening. So the obturator internus goes from the trochanter of the hip round into the pelvis and covers all the inside. It's not a pelvic floor muscle. Why? Because the idea of a pelvic floor is ridiculous. So never mind, let's talk about that another time. Yeah. <sighs> Nomenclature, it's so frustrating. But this is what I did. So bear with me on this, because this is kind of cool. Okay, and, and I did this, it's quite late at night. And what I've got going on here, I sort of put this back a little bit. This is, uh, this is gluteus. Um, Maedius, Maedius, um, and uh, this is the right side of the uh, of, of the hip. This is a pelvis. I had you see the spinal uh, uh, fusions in there. So this is the sciatic nerve that I've just peeled across the top. This is piriformis. It's very disappointing. But look at what I've got going on in here. Okay, is is piriformis joined up? There it goes. I'm picking it up joined up with obturator internus. I've cut it off and gamelis and quadratus femoris all at the same point. So this is obturator internus, and it joins up, if I cut it that way, with piriformis, both the gamelis, and the uh, sort of superior edge of uh, quadratus femoris. So that's telling us that these structures are only separated because somebody's decided they should be separated. But it's a very, very strong tenderness attachment of all of those structures onto the trochanter of the femur. Oh, it's not me. So therefore, we have to consider external rotation in the hip as being a conjoined function of several structures. And if we don't, forget piriformis syndrome. It's ridiculous. The idea that, oh, you've got piriformis syndrome because you know, it goes, uh, uh, the sciatic goes underneath it. So what? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense at all when you consider the tension those three structures are, are under. Five minutes. Excellent. Good. I've just gained three minutes extra in my life. Um, so again, what we can look at is another structure. Now, most of these structures to date are, look, are 
not being looked at in the lower limb because of stability. But the, the principle of a myofascial trochlea as a grouping, as a, as a, as a new proposed grouping, can be anywhere. Um, and, and just for, uh, you know, for fun, what I'm going to propose is that latissimus dorsi can be one as well. Why? Because what we see is we see a massive degree of blending, loading and force transmission through and across the lumbar spine with three combination structures of the thoracolumbar fascia joining up. You know, why not? So the principal rules of, of, of what I would say would be the classification of myofascial trochlea would be there will need to be some kind of bursa, either listed or not listed, there would need to be some kind of smooth surface that implies at the very least enough movement through force to be able to, to slide across the top. Look at obturator internus, we go back to obturator internus, look at this smooth surface here. Yeah. Look at the direction of force from the underside. When you look at it, you go, I, I can't see anything, it's literally hidden, it's like plantaris. You know, it's like, Can you see that? Be like, what are you talking about? He's seeing things, which I do, but you know. And then when you peel it back, you've got this incredible multi-directional load and strain. And when you look even closer, it's all wrapped around. That tells you there's some force going on in here that's linking the inside of the pelvis to the lateral trochanter of the femur. Nothing in the literature. Doesn't exist. Yeah. And same thing for all of these structures. Pezanserinus is more like a little fun name, means goose's foot. Nobody talks about it. Fibularis longus and brevis, we know it's there, but nobody talks about it when it's the conjoined structures, but they are doing a job when they're together. We understand that. So we need to reconfigure our, our language and our nomenclature, not necessarily change it, but start to pay a little bit more of attention about what things are doing when they're coming together and how that function might change. You know, you understand you've got eggs, flour, and sugar, and they do different things. You can fry an egg, you can put sugar in your tea, and you can you know, make a, a loaf of bread or just some damper with your flour and water. But when all those three comes together, we call it a cake, because the different structures coming together do mean a, a combined unit or something, and we haven't done that. So it's important that we change our, our paradigm and our thinking about what it is that we assume is anatomy. And, and it's, it's not all that. We, we're barely touching the, the sides as far as, uh, as, as far as movement is concerned. Uh, so I have a few seconds if anybody would like to ask any questions. OK. Uh, our questions. Okay. Yes. Could, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, we're going to take questions. Yes. Before. Normally when you finish the presentation, yeah, thunderous round of applause, which you're going to get. Thank you very much. How was the physics? Thought-provoking. Thought can, can I ask you a question on the last, the last bit? Yes, sir. This is, uh, anatomy's been around a long time. Yeah. It's been done on, most of it, it's been done on cadavers that are laying flat. Yes. So, it's, and it's taught still traditionally in that way. Yes. How do we change it? It's a good question. It's like, like people bring me their MRIs and they go, well, they're lying down. You know, <laughs> we can't see anything because we call it a functional MRI, but they're not in function. So they're just lying there. Um, it, it's very difficult, but what, what we can do is we can start to understand that, 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 that functional movement involves anatomical structures, but they're not the same. There is a relationship, but they're not the same thing. That, that you know, as I said, I, I want to be more stable, I turn my foot out, and now I'm more stable. That's behavioral. Um, and we can see that in, 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 our, in our donors, but we don't have that story. One of my projects that I'd like to do, if I ever have my own lab, if you know anybody that's got a couple hundred thousand to invest, then let me know, um, is to take the story of our donors you know, Mrs. Jenkins there has had back pain for 20 years. We never get that story. So if we can match up that story with our donors in, in the dissection and say, well, this is what a back of 20 years back pain looks like, or, you know, heart disease looks like, or what this medication looks like, then we can start to build a, a conjoined functional image with the anatomy together with the function. And it's never been done before. So. Thank you. That's a question from the floor. Look at that. Yes, sir. That was uh, very interesting, thank you. Thank you. Do you not get a medical history of any of your donors? Uh, well, we get a cause of death, which is 95% wrong, and then, and then 
100% of the time, I will find anything of 25 things in there. Um, and uh, in, in America, we get loads of surgeries, way more than average. Like most women have always had hysterectomies in America. Go figure, right? Um, so, so we'll always have things, and it's on the sheet. We might have, I don't know, you know, a bit of uh, heart disease or some smoking or what have you, but we'll always find 10, 15, 20 things that are abnor abnormal or of a variation that, that aren't an, on any list and probably won't even be with their doctors. You know, they may not even know about it. You find holes in it, you know, half a kidney's there, and the rest is gone. We find capsules of things, we find bits of a bullet that are, you know. And, that, and that's because the story has died with the person and their medical history is, is a tiny percentage of who and what they were through their life. You know, if, if I said to you, if I read your medical history now, then, then what would it tell us? Probably nothing about the fact that you like Formula One and spinach, you know, or, do you see what I mean? Or that you've got a niggling knee pain because you know you're not going to go to the doctor for it. So we don't get that anything to any degree of detail on, on, on their forms when they die. You know, it's, very, it's a shame. Do you want to that 30 minutes flew by because it's an absolute topic and so much that can come out of it. And, and the answers to your questions, they're thought provoking and <laughs> challenging. And, and, and you think we should be doing that. And as you heard in the introduction, I think one of the things that saddens me is that now we, we have professions that are going to go and deal with functional movement that are now not being taught functional anatomy. Correct. It, it, it does, it's not a field that actually properly exists, no. so yet, and we have to change it. But the two is a start. If you start to think about relationships, start to think what else, where no muscle attaches to a bone and never has. Muscle cannot attach to a bone. It's, it's, the, the laws of physics would, would render it impossible. It has to go on somewhere else. Where's it going? Where's it come from? Oh, we can have good fun, can we? Ladies and gentlemen, okay. Julian Bay. Thanks very much. We're if anybody's got questions. Thanks a lot. Bye now. So there we go. That was the um, that was the presentation, um, and I think it's again it's important just to emphasise that I, I'm not proposing function here of these these structures as they come together. That that's a different discussion, um, a different uh, conversation to be had, um, and much one that's much more complicated um, as far as uh, as far as the arguments or discussions or theories uh, come you know that would come from that. So that would be you know way down the track. That the first, the starting point is to say, here are these things that join up. Um, they don't really have any classification or any kind of um, discussion around them at the moment. So we need to put them in there, say, here they, here's what they are. And then from there, that sort of creates the, 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 the book from which we can then start to study them and, 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 and analyze them. And they then have a name. And so, you know, myofascial trochlea is the grouping um, that I'm proposing that we could then put these under. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's 50 years or 60 years of, of debate and discussion about function afterwards. And I'm, you know, I'm not uh, the person to have that discussion. So, um, but I think it's just an interesting way of saying, um, you know, well, isn't this interesting? Here is this grouping. There's a few of them, and there's probably more. There's some in the upper body as well, um, and we can expand that grouping um, physiologically and anatomically, and include them in our references when we when we talk about function and movement in the future. So there we go. That's that for this uh, this session. Um, again, please like and subscribe. Do consider supporting me on a Patreon. It is always incredibly helpful when that happens. And um, I will see you next time on. Not a collection of parts. Bye for now.